People who knew famous serial killer slash criminals before they were caught, what were they like? About 10 years before he murdered two young women, he came to our house. He was about 16 or 17 on his bicycle with a chipmunk he had hung with a rope and was swinging it around and acting weird. My brother and I were home alone and it was one time I know my brother was scared. We kept the doors locked. He peed in our grill and left. The whole time he was yelling, but I'm not sure it was at us. I knew too. They both grew up next door to one another. One had emotional problems, but could be a decent guy one on one. We hung out a bit and rode bikes occasionally. He killed a guy in a drug deal and stuffed the body down a well. The other was a great guy, but didn't give a fuck about anyone outside of his circle of friends and his family. We hunted and fished together every day. He once told me he wouldn't feel remorse if he killed someone outside his family. I thought it was just talk. This year his sister's husband started beating her. He ambushed him in a country road and shot him to death. Still a decent guy in my book. He was a loner in one of the biggest schools in the state. He wasn't weird or creepy or smelly or anything, but the popular kids would pick on him. He was friends with my GF. We were going to hang out one weekend, but he bludgeoned his mother to death and ran away with his GF. Spent a summer in American English as Iowa with some family. Jeffrey Damer was a neighbor a family friend. My cousin and I built a haunted house out of a playhouse in the backyard. Mostly we blindfolded the neighborhood kids and led them through. We had a bowl of grapes with some oil on them and shoved the kids hands into it and told it was eyeballs. We formed cold congealed spaghetti into what we told them were brains. I personally led Jeffrey through and every time someone says his name I wonder if I was the cause of his problems. I went to high school with a kid that raped little children on a mission trip he went on. I think the total was about 13 kids. Girls and guys. He was a well liked kid. Never did anything wrong in high school. He got sentenced to 40 years. Improbably relatively unique in that I know 3 people on death row. And one other murderer. Complete horrible human being. Threatened my life in high school and I always figured he would kill someone in a bar fight. Instead him and two friends went and he had one of them kill the husband while he chased the wife down and shot her in the back. I was called to testify for the prosecution at his last death penalty trial. He was huge and scary as hell and a truly truly horrible human being. Based on the testimony I heard, he still is. Kind of a rod guy, but pretty nice. I played Starfleet battles with him. Him and a friend killed a lady. No idea why. He seemed more of a follower than a leader, and that's pretty much how the murder went down. Still on death row. Another guy was more friends with my ex-wife. He even watched our kids a couple times. Quiet, and seemed friendly. I knew this kid in high school. He was pretty quiet, read westerns a lot. Being a big book reader I chatted a few times. He seemed very nice. One day he took a shotgun to school, and at lunch shot the guy convicted of molesting his brother. He ended up getting a slap on the wrist for it. I felt he should have gotten a medal knowing the details that came out. I suspect the judge gave him the least he could. I've posted this before. He's not famous, but still fucked up. Brad Pearson was high on meth and killed his mother also injuring his father. He cries crocodile tears and acts like he regrets it, but I knew him and know for a fact he doesn't. I went to school with him for a few years. Myself and others were harassed repeatedly by him in both sexual and violent manners. There was just something off about him. The only friends he had were the problem kids and the major assholes at school. He would make super inappropriate comments in class towards teachers and joked about school shootings and would say things just for shock value. But he was a charmer and got away with everything. I know for a fact he doesn't regret killing his mom. The murder happened only a few blocks from my house. A few years ago, I went to a gas station late at night and ran into an old friend, a guy I knew, had been serving time for some heinous shit. He stabbed his father while tripping on LSD. I heard he got out and him and I were cool, so I didn't think much of it. He was with another dude and right away the sight of the two of them sitting outside a gas station at a payphone made me uneasy. Teardrop tattoos on their faces and a desperate look about them. But my friend recognized me right away and came to say what up. His friend immediately asked for a few dollars to get a cigar. 
I told him hold up, and I'll get him on my way out. The whole time in the store I felt uneasy. It looked like they were looking for a lick, and I didn't want that to be me. So I bought a cigar, and have him like 3 bucks. I chatted for like 5 minutes with him, asked about his brother and stuff. As I hoped in my car his friend asked if we could get a ride down the street. I got in, and started the car and said nah, I can't. He started to insist, but my friend interrupted him and said nah, my man has somewhere to be, he's got a bunch of kids that are probably crying lol. About 2 weeks later 2 bodies were found smoldering along a popular jogging trail. The convicted murderer was the guy with my friend. The bodies were found within walking distance of the gas station I saw them at. My friend hung himself about a month later. Both of those guys confessed to friends and family that they didn't know how to act outside of jail and that they didn't feel like they were ready to be out. They tried to check themselves into Paish hospitals, complaining of hearing voices, but were turned away. The bodies were two high school kids who stole their neighbor's guns and were trying to sell them quick to get some pot I believe. They robbed the kids and tied them up for days. This all happened about 5 blocks from where I was living, in a relatively safe neighborhood in Florida. Jonathan David Drew was good friends with several people I hung out with, I knew him as an acquaintance. There were stories of him getting stuck out in the killing fields on at least two occasions late at night and having to be towed out. He was only convicted of one murder, but there is speculation he is responsible for several more. Jonathan David Drew convicted of killing Houston waitress Tina Flood, 23, in December of 1998. Drew was pulled over by a police officer who found Flood beaten and barely alive in Drew's front passenger seat. She died soon afterwards. Drew is suspected of several sexual assaults and a private investigator has speculated Drew could be responsible for the slaying of Jessica Lee Kane. A search of Drew's former home in Leak City, where his parents still live produced a vial containing several human teeth. The murder of Tina Flood. Tina Flood, 23, and her friend, Justin Chapman, attended a birthday party at a bar in Seabrook, Texas. The bar closed, and the party ended around 2am on Sunday, November 29th, 1998. Jonathan David Drew, 25, had been at the bar, and was introduced to Tina at the party. He bought her drinks and several people stated they saw the two of them kissing. Several people decided to go to a nearby Holiday Inn hotel, and because Tina was too intoxicated to drive, she and Justin rode to the hotel with other people. Her car was left in a parking lot next to the bar. She and Justin realized when they attempted to check into their room that Justin, who was a Holiday Inn employee, had left his employee discount card in Tina's car. Jonathan David Drew was sitting in his pickup truck in the hotel's parking lot and offered to take them back to Tina's car. Tina sat in the middle between Drew and Justin. Once they got back to Tina's car, Justin got out of the truck and held Tina's purse while she attempted to get out of the truck. As Tina was scooting across the seat toward the passenger side door of the truck, Drew drove away. Justin tried in vain to hold on to the truck door but quickly fell off. Tina screamed for Drew to stop. Justin immediately ran to the bar screaming for help. At 2.52 a.m., Seabrook police officer Mark Hatton was on patrol when he saw Justin beating on the bar's door. Justin told the officer what had just happened. Drew's truck was described as a maroon full-sized single-cab Chevrolet truck. The description of the truck was broadcast to all other officers in the area. At 3.49 a.m., Harris County Deputy Constable Seen Kitchen spotted Drew's truck and stopped him for failure to maintain a single lane of traffic. Drew was asked for his license, and when he leaned over to get it, the deputy noticed a bloody foot lying on the seat. Deputy Kitchens asked who it was and Drew replied, that's my friend Tina. She's knocked out over there. Tina was lying in fetal position against the passenger door, naked except for her skirt, which was bunched around her waist. She had abrasions on her leg, butt, and arm. Deputy Kitchens called for backup. When Drew was removed from the truck, officers noticed scratches on his arm, neck, and blood on the collar of his shirt. Tina was taken to Clear Lake Regional Medical Center, where a sexual assault exam was conducted. Tina repeatedly told the nurse, please help me, don't hurt me. She also said, please don't rape me. A CAT scan showed a skull fracture, which had caused Tina's brain to swell and hemorrhage. Doctors tried surgery to relieve the pressure, but she died a day and a half later. 
According to the medical examiner's report, Tina sustained at last two distinct fractures to her skull. This was the result of one or possibly two separate acts of blunt force trauma. A considerable amount of force was required to cause these fractures. There was an abrasion on the back of her head and a bruise on the back of her brain immediately below the point of impact. On the opposite side of her head, there was a massive amount of bleeding, but no bruise on her skin. Her ear was also swollen, and there was a bruise behind her ear. The medical examiner believed this injury to be caused by a separate impact than what caused her brain injury. Regarding the abrasions and contusions on Tina's shoulder, shoulder blade, elbow, lower back, and buttocks, these injuries were consistent with being dragged on a rough surface, like concrete. He also described a wrinkling or crumpling of the skin on Tina's back, which suggests that something scraped across her back or that she was stepped on. There was bruising in the soft tissue of Tina's neck, consistent with what is seen in manual strangulation. She also had bruising on her lower legs, ankles, and upper right arm consistent with finger impressions. And there were abrasions on her knuckles and thumbs, suggesting defensive wounds. In addition, the sexual assault exam showed that she had been raped vaginally and anally. Jonathan David Drew was found guilty of felony murder and sentenced to life in prison on October 13, 1999. He is eligible for parole on November 29, 2028. Searches of the home Drew shared with his parents turned up women's clothing, a souvenir baseball bat with an unknown stain, and a vial of human teeth. The Drew home is located on Calder Road, in League City. This the same Calder Road that is home to the killing fields, where four bodies of young women were found in the early 90s. Drew is also linked to the disappearance of Jessica Lee Kane in August 1997. My sister's best friend growing up. Her family was really strict growing up, and she kind of took that on with her son. Wouldn't let him watch regular TV, homeschooled that kind of thing. So she gets married BC she got pregnant, again BC she did this with her son's dad, and they move away, she joins the army, he cheats while she's at boot camp, they break up, then she moves with other relatives in Oregon and eventually he moves there too to be closer to his child, breaks it off with the other girl, they start to co-parent well, and get along again, everything is okay, they go on a camping trip to the mountains for his b-day with her sister, then her and the sister proceed, to shoot him 13 times while he slept, and drag and throw his body off a cliff. They come home try to cover it all up with fake facebook alibis and receipts from some gas station. Say he get, lost in the woods. The rangers find him 2 days later, and 2 days after, that she is arrested along with her sister. Sister flipped on her, and they gave her 18 months with time served. She got life without parole. Said she did it to make sure he couldn't take her kids away. Now the kids live with family and have lost both parents. I always knew that family was off. TL. Dr. Sister's best friend planned and killed husband to protect kids and threw him off cliff. Found and convicted and kids have no parents now. I dated someone who murdered a guy with his friends. It was personal. It'd make national news. A few months after we broke up, I was dating someone else. He called me and said that he was never going to be with me because he messed everything up. I was busy and I blew him off. A week later, after a holiday, I got a call from the jail, but it was like 4 o'clock in the morning and I accidentally hung up. A few years later, I looked him up and realized the call was him. I'm afraid that he holds a grudge and as his release creeps closer, I worry. So, what was he like before? Melodramatic. After we broke up. He called me and played cry me a river and told me that we were just like the song. He beat himself up a lot. Everything was a big deal. We argued a lot. He was easily influenced. He didn't have a good relationship with his parents. So his friends were all he had. He had a history of disciplinary actions in school. Respect was a huge thing. Feeling disrespected to him was the worst thing in the world. He didn't care about school. He was funny. I worked with a lady that had her husband murdered. She was a bossy, condescending, arrogant piece of white trash. Rather nicely attractive though, and very blunt sexually. She was about 15 years older, but I'd be lying if I said I hadn't thought about it. Wasn't surprised when they finally mailed her for the crime. Everybody suspected she did it. This guy isn't famous, not yet anyway. 
All this just happened maybe a month ago. Maybe a little longer. Guy's name is Adam Dentmore. He killed his girlfriend and dismembered her. He put the body in a couple of suitcases and took their one year old daughter on the road. I always thought he was an intelligent guy, but apparently he wasn't the smartest as he immediately drove from where he was living in Colorado to his hometown in NW Louisiana. Straight to his parents house, he dropped the suitcases in two separate locations along the way. Someone found one of them, and he was arrested. As far as I know they still haven't found the other suitcase. I knew him, but not very well. We used to frequent the same bar. He would sit in the corner with a beer and read. He was rude to anyone who tried to speak to him. Had that whole, can't you see I'm reading, attitude. In most cases I understand that attitude, but not in a bar. Never made sense to me. We talked a few times, but only talked at length once. I remember it being an enjoyable conversation. He was intelligent and well spoken. Also a good looking guy, but not exactly charming. On thing I remember, is he would say gods in place of oh my god. I know he lived somewhere near me, because I would see him walking around the neighborhood in occasion. With a big walking stick. So yeah, he was a bit of a strange guy, but I was shocked when I heard about the murder. It still feels weird to realize I know someone who could do something like that.